Okay. Uh, my name is Robert Hache. I'm the Vice President of Research and Innovation at York University. And I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you here today and our special guest, Dr. Harry Lehman, as we launch the Sustainable Energy Initiative Seminar Series. As you know, Dr. Lehman is a leading international renewable energy expert. He's Director General of Germany's Federal Environmental Protection Agency and Head of the Environmental Planning and Sustainable Strategies Division. We are delighted that he's accepted our invitation to be the keynote speaker and to look forward to drawing on his expertise related to the development of sustainable energy policies and programs in Germany. However, I would first like to take a few moments to tell you more about the Sustainable Energy Seminar Series and the significant research that it supports. The launch of this seminar series marks an important occasion as we come together to share and disseminate new knowledge that will contribute to a better understanding of how Ontario can strengthen its sustainable energy initiatives. Ontario, like many other jurisdictions around the world, has set ambitious goals for energy conservation and the development of renewable energy sources for the next two decades. The achievement of these goals calls for a combination of policy measures, behavioral changes, new energy systems, and technological innovations cutting across a wide variety of traditional disciplines. At York University, we are proud of our strong tradition of excellence in collaboration and innovative research. Our Faculty of Environmental Studies Sustainable Energy Initiative is a prime example of the depth and breadth of exceptional research being conducted at the university. York's researchers offer a vast range of expertise in this field across a range of subjects, including sustainable energy policy, law, planning, technology, impact assessment, and climate change and mitigation. The Faculty Sustainable Energy Initiative, led by Professors Jose Echeverry and Mark Winfield, was established to build and strengthen the teaching, research, uh, research and partnerships needed to foster the development of new green energy economies, both nationally and internationally. The project is being supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, MITACS, among others. This initiative seeks to advance sustainable energy solutions in Ontario through research, to educate and train a new cohort of sustainable energy practitioners to respond to the demand created by the Ontario Green Energy Act and similar initiatives around the world, and to enhance learning opportunities for professionals working in the industry. The Sustainable Energy, energy Seminar Series will feature monthly presentations held to explore groundbreaking research in the field and to facilitate networking opportunities for researchers, partners, government representatives, and the private sector. In closing, I'd like to thank our keynote speaker, Dr. Lehman, for leading today's seminar. I'd also like to thank Deloitte, the sponsor of this event. Lastly, I'd like to recognize the efforts of Dean Barbara Rader, Professor Mark Winfield, Professor Jose Echeverry, and their teams for putting together what promises to be an outstanding seminar series that will make an important contribution to the national and international dialogue on energy conservation and the development of renewable energy sources. And to all our guests, partners, and researchers, thank you for your participation and enjoy the event. We look forward to seeing you again during the monthly seminars to be held throughout the year. Good morning and welcome. I'm Barbara Rader, the Dean of the Faculty of Environmental Studies. And I also want to thank Deloitte in particular for sponsoring this morning's uh, first launch of our um, breakfast series. And uh, remind any of you uh, present who are interested in sponsoring another one of these events, we have many opportunities. <laughs> and you can talk to uh, Mark, Jose, or uh, Sandy Tiemann. Sandy. Um, the Faculty of Environmental Studies is actually the oldest environmental studies program in Canada. Our faculty include ecologists, urban planners, policy analysts, social scientists, and artists. We offer a unique and creative mix of broadly interdisciplinary environmental programs at the graduate and undergraduate levels. 
We are constantly reinventing ourselves and our field by creating new specializations within the faculty, things such as urban ecology, food security, neotropical urbanization, um, conservation, and um, our sustainability, uh, our sustainable energy initiative is uh, potentially, I think, one of the most innovative things we've done in the last 10 years. Uh, under the leadership of uh, Mark Winfield and Jose Echeverry, we have attracted an unprecedented number of uh, adjunct professors and students interested in contributing to the growing need for skilled and knowledgeable expertise in energy efficiency, conservation, and demand management. Our motto is challenge what is, imagine what could be. I, uh, in particular, would like to thank uh, Robert Hache, uh, Harry Lehman, Mark Winfield, Jose Echeverry, Peter Love, and Tanya Roberts for all their work in organizing this series and kicking it off this morning. Thank you. Uh, Mark. Thanks, Barbara. <clears throat> I'm just going to say a few brief words about uh, the Sustainable Energy Initiative and what it is and uh, what we hope to achieve through the initiative. Uh, the initiative was driven by a number of different considerations. Uh, the growing international and domestic interest in renewable energy and energy conservation in the, concept, in the context of challenges like climate change and the need to meet energy needs in a post-Fukushima world. Uh, we've seen very, very strong bottom-up demand among our graduate and undergraduate students around energy efficiency and energy and renewable energy. And finally, in, in the conversations that we had with, with various stakeholders in the energy field in Ontario, uh, we got a very, very clear message about the need for highly qualified personnel in areas of planning, law, policy, economics, behavioral sciences, management around sustainable energy. And the initiative is very much intended to respond to these demands and drivers. It has a number of dimensions related to curriculum, research, and building partnerships. On the curriculum side, uh, we're at the stage now, we've taken a number of initiatives to introduce new courses and new content. Uh, we're in the final stages of receiving approval for a new certificate program in sustainable energy as part of our Honors Bachelor of Environmental Studies program. Uh, that will actually be uh, include a co-op year option, which is a new component that we're also introducing here at FES. Uh, we, are, we will be in, in uh, looking for co-op placements, uh, if anybody has any uh, opportunities out there. Uh, you'll possibly be hearing from our staff shortly. At the graduate level, we've had a growing cohort of students entering our Master of Environmental Studies program with a very, very, very strong interest in renewable energy, climate change policy, and energy efficiency. We've been making a number of modifications to our curriculum to, to accommodate those interests and encourage those interests. Uh, one of the most important things we've been doing is incorporating field placements and internships. Uh, a good many of them, both here in Ontario and overseas, particularly through Professor Echeverry's partnerships, uh, uh, we've actually just had a cohort of students come back from uh, this summer who did uh, internships in Germany and Denmark and other places overseas. On the research side, uh, we've had a very strong focus on renewables, on uh, energy conservation, particularly here in Ontario, and more broadly, the sustainability of energy systems, especially, again, as it applies to the electricity system here in Ontario. A, we have, as part of our master's program, students are required to do major research papers or theses, and uh, we will actually be posting a number of the more recent papers on the SEI website shortly. Our students have been doing some wonderful work on renewables, on the rollout of the Green Energy Act in Ontario, on combined heat and power, uh, where the state of the conversation is on energy efficiency and conservation, uh, on climate change policy as well. And I think their, their, their work is, is really well positioned to make construction of contributions to these debates here in Ontario. Partnerships are a central component of the initiative, and we've built a number of partnerships both 
here in Ontario and internationally. In Ontario, we've entered into a memorandum of agreement with Centennial College, uh, with the Courtright Center, with the Toronto Region Conservation Authority. Uh, we're also one of the founders of the Ontario Net Network for Sustainable Energy Policy, which is at the moment a, a semi-formal collaboration among university faculty interested in energy and electricity policy in Ontario. It's a very, very multidisciplinary group, engineering, political science, geography, economics, environmental studies, uh, business and management. Uh, and I think it's, it's been a very useful vehicle for, for uh, collaboration and bringing together some thinking about how we're approaching energy issues in the university community in Ontario. Uh, Jose, in particular, has been very active in building international partnerships as well for the initiative uh, with uh, both institutions and universities overseas, and indeed he just came back from Europe with a whole tranche of new potential partnerships which we're pursuing and was just in Asia, I think, doing much the same sort of thing. So the opportunities uh, to build partnerships, I think, are, are continuing to expand. We find resonance <clears throat> wherever we go with, with what we're trying to do and where we're trying to go with the initiative. We have an advisory committee, uh, which is, is intended to help us uh, guide the exercise, to strengthen these partnerships, to help us think through where should we be going next, where are the next opportunities, where is the next need. And as we're thinking forward, there are a couple of areas that we are particularly interested in building capacity within the faculty. We've heard very clearly, uh, both from students and from practitioners, uh, the need to build capacity around the economics of sustainable energy, particularly the microeconomics of projects. We're actually hoping we may be in a position to make a strategic hire in that area in the near future. And we also are seeing very strong interest in the notion of community energy planning. We actually have a very strong land use planning program as part of the faculty, and we're having a number of students coming forward saying, well, we're, we're very interested in this notion of how how do we integrate energy supply, conservation, urban design, transportation into some sort of a coherent package? And I think that's another area where we would very, very much like to be able to build capacity in the future. Enough from me, enough about SEI. I'm now going to ask uh, Professor Jose Echeverria to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, that was a uh, very good uh, overview of what we're trying to do here at the uh, Faculty of Environmental Studies. And uh, one of the things that uh, was missing uh, was that uh, we also have a guest from uh, Natural Resources Canada, uh, Dinesh, um, you may want to say hello to, to friends. Um, we're developing a memorandum of understanding with uh, Red Screen. Um, and I asked uh, Dinesh permission to mention this. It should have been there. so. Um, my oversight. Um, and um, rather than go through the list of uh, acknowledgements, I want to say thank you to all of you uh, that woke up early uh, this morning uh, to be in this room. And the fact that you're here clearly illustrates that you care uh, about what's going on in our planet. Uh, I see a lot of uh, friends uh, on tables and also people that I have not seen. So that's good. Uh, it means that you'll have the opportunity to, to meet very interesting people. Um, so my job's uh, to introduce Harry, uh, and I could do that on the traditional strategy, which is to provide you an overview of his many academic, professional uh, accomplishments. Uh, but I think I better tell you what motivates us, uh, because that's a personal part of the story that really counts. Um, when I met with um, Harry in June uh, to ask him to come here to see us, I explained to him that our province was at a crossroads of sorts. Um, and that crossroads, it's actually articulated by the fact that a lot of people are saying things that, number one, are inaccurate, and number two, are uh, misleading. Um, and today you will have the opportunity to hear from a person uh, that has uh, a very, very integral inside knowledge of how a country uh, that is highly industrialized, uh, that is highly populated, uh, and that has led the planet in manufacturing and engineering and industrial innovation, has decided to make a transition away from polluting sources of uh, energy generation. Um, and he will be able to answer 
uh, a number of questions uh, at the technical level or at the financial level that you may want to uh, pose. So at least you walk away from today knowing a lot uh, about Germany. Uh, so in the future when you read things that are misleading, you'll know uh, that's not really the case. Uh, and also you'll know who to email to ask a question for clarification. But about motivation is uh, Professor Winfield mentioned that I've been traveling a lot. Uh, and when I was in June in uh, uh, Germany, I saw something very interesting. People uh, in every German city that I was, and I traveled from the south of Germany to the north all the way to uh, Denmark and Norway, people on the streets were asking their governments to stop uh, the use of nuclear power. Um, and this was in response to the uh, very, very huge accident in Fukushima. Um, and I thought that was a very interesting situation because a tradition of uh, pro-renewables anti-nuclear had been in Germany for a long time. We all know that, but now has been brought to the forefront. Uh, um, but I did not understand what was going on until uh, a couple of days ago when I had the honor and the pleasure of being in Tokyo uh, for the birth of the Japanese Renewable Energy Foundation. So I arrived to Tokyo, and the first thing that happens, uh, a friend of mine greets me in the hotel lobby, hotel very much like this one, and says, Jose, here's a Japanese radiation measuring device. Would you like to go and do some research since you're an academic? And I'm, okay, uh, sure. Um, so he, she explains how to use this machine, and I take an indoor reading uh, with this machine that uh, basically takes uh, measurements on micro servers per hour. So the concentration inside of the hotel uh, was uh, 0 0.0405. Uh, I, like a good scientist, proceeded to note this in my notebook, took a few pictures, and proceeded to map my way outside of the hotel. The first reading that I did was 200 meters from the hotel, uh, close to the waterfront, and the concentration was 0 0.105 microsieverts per hour. Um, I continue to do uh, a walk. Uh, it was getting late uh, in the evening, and the um, uh, next concentrations were 0 0.139, um, 0 0.12, um, so in other words, three to four times more radiation was outside than inside of the building. When I came back, um, I told my findings to, to my colleague and she said, well, yeah, we do have a problem as you can see, but the problem is most serious in Fukushima where the concentrations are 3.8 microsieverts per hour. And I'm sharing this with you because nobody in the West, except in countries like Germany, are talking about this. The crisis in Fukushima, it's an ongoing disaster. It has not been solved, it is an ongoing disaster. So those of you that know me know that I talk about climate change uh, a lot, uh, but I wanted to share this with you because the sense of urgency of what I saw was crystallized the day after when we met with uh, the richest person in Japan. Uh, is a gentleman called uh, Mr. Son. And Mr. Son is the owner of a bank, a very big bank in Japan. And he brought uh, 30 experts to a hall where there were about a thousand Japanese people for the birth of the Japanese Renewable Energy Foundation. I wanted to share this with you because today Japan has made the decision to move away from polluting sources of uh, energy generation towards renewable efficiency and conservation sources. That is a fact. And the, grow is, the fastest growing industry today in the planet is renewable energy. For the second year, uh, renewable energy has uh, garnished more investment worldwide than the fossil fuel industry. So think about that for a minute. The world has made a transition and it's making a transition to renewable energy. The giants are now in Asia. China is a renewable energy giant today. The potential for renewable energy in countries like Mongolia are humongous and will change the map of Asia for generations to come. And because of what's going on in Japan, the 
um, incentive to do this transition has become uh, put into high drive. So coming back to Harry, Harry is a person that has been charged by his government to map out this transition uh, to a sustainable energy paradigm in Germany. And the last thing I'm going to say uh, about Harry is that when we met in uh, the train from Berlin to Hamburg, he told me, Jose, politicians are going to announce this weekend what the year of the phase out of nuclear power will be in our country. This was a Friday. The announcement was made on the Sunday. And he said to me, watch this phase out date, because it could be the year 2017. And he will explain to you the modeling that has led to that calculation. Of course, for political reasons, the year chosen was not 2017, but it was 2022. But that obeyed to politics. And that is my last comment. The future is what we make about in the present. So the decisions that we make in matters of energy, and for that matter, on any infrastructure decisions that affect the life of the citizens of a nation, there is nothing set in stone to do uh, anything. It is our choice to have a better future. And we start building a better future today in the present. And the last, and this is the last one, is that I showed everywhere I went photos of our cold face out. I was in Bangkok, I was in Hong Kong, I was in Tokyo in this trip, and people did not have a clue that Ontarians were doing that, changing the future by getting rid of uh, coal. And a lot of people say, you have changed my impression of Canadians due to the picture that you just showed me. My impression was that you were people that um, did not respect the Kyoto Protocol and uh, have emissions that are going high. And I had to explain, well, Ontario is a different place, and we're trying to do things differently. That is my parting comment to you. There is no reason why Canada could not follow the footsteps of Germany. And my friend Harry Lehman will tell us how Germany is doing it uh, and how Canada could do it, most importantly. So please give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Yes. Good morning. Um, so much welcome words. Hopefully, I will not uh, speak that bad that you think, oh, what happened? <laughs> I'm physicist from training. I have uh, started working with renewable energies uh, 26, 27 years ago. And uh, it's part also of, the, of my history, what happened in the last 25 or 26 years in Germany and in Europe. Not forgetting Germany is part of Europe. A lot of things which we are doing and uh, successes we have are also uh, given to the fact that we are part of the European Union. I want to give you a little bit history because to understand the challenge we have today, we have to look into the history and to imagine what could be, we look from today into tomorrow. And that's what I try to do and at the end I want to conclude a little bit with uh, not saying how you could do it, because I'm not a teacher for you, but uh, showing what we learned in Germany and what could be continued together. It's something which should be done together and not, I'm not a teacher of Canada or someone else. I only can tell our story and you can take over what you think that's uh, worthwhile to take over. So. History. Uh, we, if you look in Germany and you look at the discussion about uh, Germany and its um, um, energy discussion in the last um, decades, we had several important and um, very hitting situations. The first one was the oil crisis in the 70s. Everyone today in my age remembers that in a country like Germany, a car, mad, a mad car, you know, every German needs at least one and a half cars because we are mad of cars. In this country, suddenly there were Sundays where there was forbidden to drive cars, um, so everyone had to go by foot. That was in the 70s. In the same decade, 
um, our scientists detected a climate problem. And the first parliament in the world which started, which had a commission about climate change was the German parliament in the years 79 to 82. And then in parallel of that, we had a huge problem with our coal industry. The coal industry, which had hundred thousands of workers in Germany, diminished to some 10,000. And all this in the 70s and 80s. So it was, um, there were different re reasons in Germany to discuss what is the energy future for Germany already in the 70s. And that was not due to environment, not due to whatever, it was to heavy economic impacts in the field of coal, oil, and others. And clearly arising the, the, the problem of climate change. And since then, we have the tradition of a lot of institutions, of policy makers, advisors, of uh, parliament, of parties, to think about, at least every party has since then in their programs a chapter about the energy future of Germany. So there's a tradition of fighting about what is the energy vision of Germany. And this is the base of the story because we started very early due to different, re completely different reasons. Today, coal industry is still existing in Germany, but it is negligible. And the subsidies we pay for the coal workers, um, it would be better to pay them directly because the subsidies is twice they get in the year. But you know, it's part of the German culture, so we put it into um, our subsidy basket, which we will have to pay for another five or six years, and then the last one has died off. Um, the, that's the history, and you have to know that. And then you know that in the beginning, in the first half of the 80s, there were several institutions and several scientists, including me, who started to make first scenarios about Germany in the year 2020, 2030. And then the next thing hit Germany, it was Chernobyl. Chernobyl was a real crisis for Germany because what, we were the country where the most fallout went down. And uh, for a lot of people, I'm still, it was a hard time at that time. At, the, at that time, a lot of people, mothers had to take out their children from kindergarten and others because there was too much fallout for one week. And this changed Germany's perception of nuclear. After that, there was no party saying that there, is, um, th that there is no phase out. The only thing was how long nuclear will sustain. The Conservative Party in the 90s said it will sustain until 2050. The Green said immediately shut down. So that was uh, the discussion about nuclear phase out in the 90s in Germany. And it evolved. It evolved that in the, in the last decade, we had uh, a phase out date of 2026, and then came Fukushima. And this history is necessary to know that um, it was possible in a country like Germany, after these decades of discussion, what is the real future, to make fast decisions, because the decisions were not made on fast knowledge. It was a long tradition of discussion, only it was not possible more to sustain certain strategies. That's important to know if we talk about history in Germany, uh, if we talk what happened in Germany and that uh, millions of people went on the street or something like that. So that's one of the part. And uh, now I try to get f uh, PowerPoint running and that looks nice. That looks very nice. And uh, okay. So yeah, that's solar driven. It's a system completely solar driven, but uh, I will not stay with this system. If we talk about the, the future, we have to talk a little bit about uh, what we um, are, have our goals today in Germany. Uh, and one of the things we have in Germany as, as goals is that uh, our, our country and also the European Union committed itself to lower the greenhouse gas emissions by 2020, 2030, and 2050. It's also something where you have a consensus in all parties, and the consensus is that we have to lower our greenhouse gas emissions until 2020 by 40 percent. That's German goal. The, the um, European goal is 2020, 20, 20 and um, in the year 2020, 20 percent greenhouse gas re reduction and 20 percent of renewable energies. We Germans are trying to do a little bit more. We didn't convince the other countries to follow us with the 
greenhouse gas uh, lowering. But that's a consensus through all parties and also in the society. The only question is how fast and what are the instruments, which part of the society has to move faster and other things. So this computer is again working and uh, so I apologize that the next transparency is not coming. Um, we have a long-term goal. A long-term goal means that we want to go by 2050 lowering 80% greenhouse gas. This is also part of all uh, programs of today parties. There is no party where it's not written into the program. It's also today consensus in the society that we have to reach this. Part of the the strategy until today, because this is nothing new, was the, 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 the renewable energy strategy and other things like buildings, the cars, I leave away today. If we go in, into that and we try to look into the development of renewable energies as part of this greenhouse gas strategy, then uh, um, the if you look at this development, it starts in the year 1990. We had in the year 1990 the first uh, acts to bring renewable energy into the electrical grid. It was a voluntary um, allowance to utilities. At that time, we had no unification. At that time, we had a monopolistic system of the electrical system. So it was a voluntary rules to in include renewable energies into the electric production. And it was a maximum price increase by 5%. So it means if, uh, for example, um, Aachen um, the utility in Aachen decided to build wind farms or whatever, they could rise the price for their uh, people by 5%. This was the beginning of a few installations. In the same time, we had something like the 100 megawatt wind program. We had the 1,000 uh, PV roof programs in Germany to start getting um, knowledge about the technologies. And this was the 90s, more or less the 90s, where not much happened in Germany. And we invented one um, <laughs> instrument after the other. We had in this time the liberalization, we had the unification, we had uh, new European rules, and at the end of the um, 90s, uh, some people invented that what is named feed-in tariff. From the experience we had in Germany, that it doesn't move with um, the, the rules and the instruments we had before that, quotas, everything. It was, you had a lot of s different things, and some people, Hermann Scheer, for example, has to be named, invented that what is feed-in tariff. Hermann Scheer is an, he was a parliamentarian at the German parliament with others, and the, the law went through uh, the parliament in the week before the summer um, holidays, and no one was aware uh, how much these feed-in tariff would change Germany. And the, I never forget the commentary of one of the uh, big utility CEOs who said, renewable energies never will have more than 1% of the German electrical production, so I don't care about a feed-in tariff. So he was asked, and okay, that was the opinion at the end of the 1980s in, in Germany. But it changed, if you look there, what it changed is the feed-in tariff led to an increase of renewable energy in the electrical market by 17% today. So that's what we have. We expect we will hit 20% in this year due to the increase in wind and photovoltaic, biomass, geothermal, and all these electric producing things. It changed completely the game and it is the history we have, and I will come back to the history if we talk about jobs and economic opportunities for the future. Now, we are in Germany, and that's the actual situation. We committed ourselves to have 35 to 40 percent in the year 2020. That's the history. And uh, maybe to look at the actual structure, it's not only PV. If you look at the structure of electricity supply from renewable energies last year, you have wind energy, you have hydropower, you have biomass, and you have photovoltaics. These are the four big. We have not yet um, geothermal, 
due to the fact that geothermal electric production is starting now. It needs a lot of time to drill, to build all these appliances until you have it on the grid, but it's running and we expect in the next year a lot of these things. The situation at the moment, if you, if you take the situation at the moment, phase out, everyone will ask, our, will ask what is, why can you phase out? So that's history and development of renewables. Now, phase out of nuclear. Why is Germany able to phase out the nuclear so rapidly? One answer to that is clearly that we have increased the efficiency of our electric use dramatically in the last 20 years. It is nothing new. We have efficiency plans in Germany due to the oil crisis, the coal crisis. We started early with that. And if you look at an average German household, it, it uses only 3,500 kilowatt hours per year. And it will decrease the 3,500 kilowatt hours per year to something about 2,500 due to already existing laws, European and German laws, about energy efficiency. We are phasing out certain types of lamps. You are not able more to get classical um, uh, heating bulbs in Germany and in Europe. We are fa we're having strategies to forbid technologies to have standby electrical use. You know, in Germany, only, only three three to four big utilities are running for standby losses. Every German household pays every year 100 euro uh, only for having, having all these small lamp, lamps on in their household. If you take that away, you could take out four big utilities, four big uh, nuclear plants, if you like that, to compare it. And that's energy efficiency, that's part of the story. And part of the story is also increasing the use of um, co-generation and other things. So let's look at the actual situation before I go into the future. What can we do in the next 20 years? Nuclear phase out. What is the right date? 2017, 2022, whenever you like it. After 2017. We had a discussion in Germany due to climate change reasons. The Conservative Party in Germany wanted to prolong the lifetime of nuclear due to climate change reason, because they said that the others will not move that fast as we expect, and that was the reason to prolong the nuclear um, running time. It was not, as quoted in some uh, newspapers, it was not the allowance to build new ones. It was only the allowance to retrofit the old ones and to give them 10, 15 years additional lifetime. And it was also clear that that is the last uh, 10, 15 years they get. After Fukushima, they took that back, and we had a decision to phase out until 2022. Let's look into the power supply in Germany at the January 2011. Um, this is the installed capacity we have in Germany today. It's something about 160 gigawatt. So that's what is installed from the different sources. Um, the green one are the renewables, hydroelectric, nuclear, gas, etc., lignite, and at the bottom would be others, different things. What we, if, if you go very conservative with a model, uh, with an electrical capacity secured supply model the utilities use in Europe means you have to count that a cable breaks down at least. You have to count that during certain situations at least one of the big um, plants goes, trips off, etc. They have a lot. What is the worst case that can happen at a certain day in Germany? And then you have only an installed secured capacity of 93 gigawatt. If everything is bad, it's night, no wind, uh, terrorist attack, uh, someone hits uh, with a big autobus one of the high voltage lines and the guy in one of these controlling um, uh, units is uh, tired or whatever, he's not able to switch all these things. So in the worst case, you can imagine, and you know Fukushima was not even the worst case, it was so you always have to count with the worst, 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 worst case. And if you take that, Germany has an installed capacity, a secure installed capacity 
of 93. And now we go into the maximum necessity of capacity in the last 10 years. For the people who are dealing a little bit with electricity, they know what it is. That was one time in 10 years we needed something about 80 gigawatt. So it's one 15 minutes we needed 80 gigawatts. After that it went down, before that it went up. So, but let's take that for discussion reasons. This 15 minutes of 80 gigawatts. Then we have a reserve of 13 gigawatt. And if you look at that, you know that this means that we can switch off 8.4 gigawatt of nuclear plants. That was the reason why we said to the government, switch off, Doesn't, nothing happens. And if you look into the history the last three years, uh, there were at least eight, seven, eight gigawatt of nuclear plants off because they had problems. So we switched off seven, the seven oldest, the Fukushima type, and one of the plants which always had problems, and uh, we thought that it might be good to get that out of, of uh, the game. And then we decided a phase out of the nuclear power plants until 2022, and then in 2022, a total of 20.4 gigawatt are off the grid. But how can we manage that? Because that's now until 2020. What have, do we have to do that we get the additional um, reserve capacity? Let's look again. Power supply in Germany, January 2011 to 2022. You know this is, the black one is the secured capacity in January 2011. Then we expect fossil power plants, which are under construction at the moment, where it's no planning, it's no administrative problems, they are constructed. One of them is, went last week to grid. Um, these are 13.3 gigawatt coming. Then you have to calculate if some of the fossil fuel power plants will be decommissioned. We don't believe it because the industry says that it will retrofit it. Nevertheless, let's take the worst case, it goes down. And then you have to switch off uh, all your nuclear power plants, which, and this is 18.3 because they already were some off, so the 20.4. So. But in January 2022, we have, if you take the worst case, a gap of 8 gigawatt. So we have 10 years now to fill these 8 gigawatt. But please be aware, we have energy efficiency programs running, we have also uh, renewable energy build up, and what is not on this picture is the running cogeneration from small utilities which are going now into the market, which were stalled because of the very low, um, or the concurrency with nuclear energy. The nuclears are running 24 hours, the problem was that cogeneration energy was not uh, economic, fighting against nuclear, which sold for every price as long as they could get rid of the electricity. So now, with phasing out the nuclear, the market opens for cogeneration, so we expect at least 5 gigawatt of cogeneration in until 2020. That's actual. That's the reason why we know that we can go out. And again, that's only Germany, but Germany is part of an European grid. So even if this doesn't work, we could manage it with others or we would manage it with demand management. And again, this 80 gigawatt peak was for one quarter of an hour at a certain day. In the other time, there was no problem with that. So that's actual situation and the reason why we could phase out our nuclear that fast and without problems. We have only in this winter the possibility, if everything goes wrong, that in South Germany, the majority of nuclear plants are in South Germany, there might be the necessity to switch on a special coal or gas plan. The reason is that the electrical grid uh, companies haven't reinforced the north-south line in Germany that fast as they ha had planned to. So if you switch off a lot of nuclear plants in the south and you have a certain weather condition, you have to have a reserve in the south for that situation. But it's not, it's a cold reserve, what, how we name it, a cold reserve if one or two other plants will not work. So that's a lot of data, but I thought it's important that we are not running crazy in Germany, that we know what we are doing, that we are... Uh, <laughs> Look, we have to run all these bloody cement and steel and other companies and Daimler, all that, and you know they hit us very hard if we go outside and tell that uh, it's possible and then, then doesn't run.
So that's the story about the, the actual situation. Now let's ask ourselves about the future, which is much more interesting from my point of view. Um, ask where, where can we go? And uh, we started in, in the agency years ago in, uh, to ask ourselves what could be the renewable energy supplies for Germany and Europe. What are the archetypes of the uh, possible um, future of renewable energies in Germany and Europe? And if you take these archetypes, uh, then we have very different um, types of renewable energy supply. <coughs> you have decentralized and centralized. Decentralized means on a roof, centralized, a big plant somewhere offshore or in a desert. You have local nearby, so you use that what is here in your region, or you go in an international cooperation, what do you say it? Mongolia, Mongolia to China. It's a huge international and far away where they want to supply. Japanese had the idea of make a cable around the world and always feeding in photovoltaics so that it's all somewhere ever, uh, the sun always shines. These are all the ideas which are existing, but we have also some people in Germany and in Switzerland which are building so-called plus energy houses, houses which are producing more energy than they use in the year. And so our question uh, was, as an agency, if we want to advise parliament, society, um, about the future, we have to go and to look into these different archetypes and answer what is the right path for Germany. And we started clearly with local nearby, local outer key. You start down there and end there and we will see. Local outer key, as an example for your imagination, for ex is this. It's uh, Wilhelmsburg, it's a part of the city of Hamburg. It's a city which has it's a typical German city with industry, with uh, harbor, with a lot of people living in different house types, etc., etc. They started years ago in the International Architectural Exhibition to study if Wilhelmsburg could supply itself with renewable energies and at what date and how much and at what cost. To do that with a combination of everything, what you think, photovoltaic, uh, building, um, geothermal use, etc., etc. Uh, it is a study done very detailed, house by house, street by street, there's a lot of people in it. I'm part of the um, council who advises and um, helps all these people counting, you know, in, in ethnicity counting, in, I don't know, you know, nuts counting, you, they have to count every, every small piece. It's a, it's, a, it's a boring work looking into the roofs and how much photovoltaic you can put on this roof and not on that roof and how much solar thermal there. And they are making house by house, roof by roof a program. And what comes out is that uh, you can deliver, this is the, the scenario uh, which was made on. This is the actual situation in 2007. And this is 2050 here. And what you see is that uh, this is the population of Wilhelmsburg, and this is the electrical supply, and there is 100%. So somewhere in 2030, Wilhelmsburg can produce more electricity than they need as a city, as a part of a city. It's an extremely decentralized autark system. Um, and the others are following later heat. Transport is excluded because for such a small uh, thing, you can't calculate the transport. So what we learned from that is that if you go into such a future Wilhelmsburg, uh, this is a sketch of, a, of someone, who, of, of these uh, people there, with wind, with photovoltaic solar thermal, with building up parks, with using old Second World War utilities as, uh, um, as part of the energy system, we can do it. That's one part of that. We can do it on a local outer uh, system. We have a lot of examples for that. Let's go into the other direction. If you think about international cooperation, could Germany supply in an international cooperation its renewable energy completely? This is, uh, it was presented in 2004 at the Bonn Renewable Energy Conference, International Conference of the Countries. It is 
It, this is presented every two years with another name. It goes back into the 90s. In the 90s, this was already presented by Hefele. Hefele wa was at the YASA and he presented nuclear and solar combination. This Mediterranean collaboration is something which runs every two years through the, the newspapers. I was also responsible two times for that. But the idea is we have the big collaboration of the different regions. North Norway, you have water, and you have Denmark, you have wind. You have in the east, you have wind and water, and Russia, you have in Turkey a lot of electricity coming from solar heating, etc., etc. The different colors show that. And the idea is making an, an European grid, an Euro Mediterranean collaboration. There are different instruments to do that. Um, I proposed uh, years ago a so called feed in tariff for Europe. That means that every kilowatt hour which comes from renewable energies from such countries gets a feed in tariff, European feed in tariff, and that helps these countries to build up their own structure. Today it's named Desert Tech, which has a different approach, but it is one possible solution, and we have looked into this. And to give you an answer, yes, it is possible. The problem is, Two problems we have with that, Se political security in these regions. Uh, we don't know, uh, we have seen what happens in North Africa at the moment, so it is not uh, the, the choice we would uh, suppose, uh, we would give to the, to the German government looking on the se security of supply. But technical and economically it's makeable, so let's wait what happens, but, but you have to start now to build these big cables and all these things. Then something in between, Let's take a regional network, regions. Uh, for example, if you look at Germany, uh, from the point of view which regions are going into 100%, then you see all these, these uh, colors there. We'll come back later on that. And all these colors are regions where there are strategies, where they are developing strategies for a regional supply with renewable energy. That means that land area and cities collaborate together to get the most out of their region, and then the different regions collaborate with other regions trying to fulfill the holes you have sometimes. And this is a regional network. You have a mixture of far and near, of decentralized and centralized. Um, we, we looked very, to give you one first answer is, this is the technological and ecological and economical region where we can find solutions. We had in the last three years about a dozen of different studies coming from different institutions, even from the classical energy uh, institutions. Everyone, everyone has shown that we can solve the problem until 2050, going 100% renewable in this 40 years in Germany with differences. The one likes more there, the other one likes more there. It's clear that certain utilities which have a lot of money, which have a lot of capital, are looking into big international collaboration. Why? Uh, they spend one time a lot of money and then they have 10% of renewable supply in Germany. Others, like cities, are looking there because they want to put money into their own regional economic and some other people are trying to get local autark to have as much as possible from their houses. So we have in Germany at the moment everyone putting its money into that or that or that or that and all these are possible to fulfill and I bet with you that Ontario uh, can do that also even easier than we because we are we have bad conditions. A lot of people, 80 million, sitting very near, and really our um, or sun conditions and others are not that good. So we had a lot of scenarios. And now let's look into one scenario only that you don't get the feeling that, again, we are talking about painting. Now you know that you can make a scenario, taking a drawing uh, a pencil and, and then say, okay, that's it. What we are doing is we are looking very deeply into models. We are modeling Germany in detail with hourly resolution in electrical system, all things. We have a model of Germany and we are playing God and doing different worlds of Germany 2050 and then going back to today and saying, okay, um, that could be a solution. And I will take one example because it's uh, one example I like most. It's one of the dozen. It's the, the example where I asked, where we, we had a group and we asked ourselves, 
what is the maximum Germany could do by uh, its own potentials? What is the, it will never happen. It's one of these scenarios, you know, you have a solution room, all this green is possible, and where it will go is depending on what we are doing, but let's take the edge Germany has to supply itself completely with renewables. What is the, the is, is it possible or not? First, we looked into the energy demand into the year, two, that's 2005, 2008, and 2050. These are household, these are small and medium-sized enterprise, and this is the industry. You see, we will not kill German industry. German, the, the industry will still have a huge amount of energy needs in the year 2050. Uh, we will, well, mainly we win uh, by bettering our housing condition, building codes and other things. But the energy, and what that was, was very surprising for us, whatever we do is the an amount of electricity we need in the year 2050 is stable or or increases. Whatever green green or other scenario you take, it goes up. So that's one of the things we have learned from the dozens of scenarios. The reason is different. Mobility, electromobility. It is the internet which is increasing. You know, if you increase the, the necessity of, of, of servers uh, by a factor of two, only by increasing the, the, your photographs, you, by a factor, the resolution of your photographs, a factor of two, you increase the electricity also by a factor of two, all needed to run this internet, etc. So we, that's in a, then what we have is much more pumping energy because you use geothermal instead of uh, oil and other things. And this increases the amount of electricity need. Um, and then we went into something very, we, we made an energy system based completely on renewable sources. On the one side, PV, hydro, wind, geothermal, solar power, biofuels, collectors and solar architecture. On the other side, industry, residential, commercial and transport. And in between all that, what you can see in cogeneration, power plants, furnaces, and they are connected. So it's make that, that's the, the easy picture in the computer model is much more detailed. We calculated what is the amount of um, potentials in Germany. We have a GIS, a graphical information system, where we can put in data for wind energy, uh, distances for noise reduction, distances for natural conservation, and then at the end a number comes out how much windmills we can put in or how much photovoltaic we can put in. And we have done this, and we said, okay, we take Germany as a highly level natural conservation. Only this highly level of uh, noise reduction means that we don't want the people to suffer noise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you have what we say the green, green, green potential, and uh, this is the potential. And we take this potential, and you look what is possible. And if you look at that, you realize that we had a scenario where we can deliver 90 percent of the electricity produced in Germany. We need, clearly, we need some storage systems for that um, because this system has a problem. The problem is already today in Germany. In certain regions of Germany, renewable energies today already produce more than the electrical demand is. There are days where the price on the, on the electrical, on, for electricity on the bars is negative. People are paying you money if you you should take electricity. This is the other side of renewable energies. If there are times where you don't have, but there are times where you have huge amount of. So one of the things we, we, and we are doing at the moment in Germany a lot in that, is to increase storage, electricity storage system. And there are different storage systems, pumped storage power station. It's 40 gigawatt hour in Germany, not very, in, we can't increase it very much. But what we think is that chemical storage systems, besides the uh, electromobility, but chemical storage systems are the future, and we think especially that we uh, change electricity in hydrogen and into methane. Today it's only demonstration phase, they are the first things running, but we expect that the price will go down, and we, it has a huge advantage for Germany because we have a natural gas grid with a storage capacity of 200 terawatt hours. 200 terawatt hours means that the existing natural gas system is an electricity storage of three to four months. 
if you convert this gas into electricity with an average efficiency of 50%, you have 100 terawatt hours. And so we think it is the cheapest way to go and to use the existing natural gas system to solarize the natural gas system year by year with solar hydrogen and solar methane. And then in the year 2050, we have um, the solar methane. It, and it solves problems with our buildings because expectably, natural gas will run out in Europe somewhere in 50, 60 years. And if we can make this change, helping with renewable energy, also the buildings, so it fits nicely together, and also with the transportation system, because um, BMW and Daimler is very happy about that, because they don't have to um, solve their problems with efficiency. <laughs> they solve it. No, they have to do it. But at the moment, they like that, because they would not need that. So, OK. This is storage, and if you take that, Germany could supply. You have an installed capacity which of photovoltaic, of wind, of all what you need, and production, again, photovoltaic, wind, energy, etc. But the first question is, does this bloody system run all the year? Does this bloody system trip off, or are there brownouts, blackouts, all these things? So what we did is first we calculated the monthly average. That's uh, not giving you a real answer. But then we entered a simulation with hourly real data. We took the years 2006 to 2009. We had the data measurement of demand. We have the data of the weather all over Germany. The years 2006 to 2009 are very different. This one year with a lot of wind, one year with where wind was almost not there. A typical average, what is a typical average year in climate change, but a typical average year of the last 15 years, and something where it was a very cold winter. So, but you have to use real weather data, because if not, you can't see at the correlations of the different installations. When wind is at the, for example, if there's a storm going over Germany, the starts first in the north to produce with wind energy, and later it is in the mid and later in the south. So you have to have real weather data. With, with statistical data, you can't see how the system evolves. And what you see here very nicely is that the winter date, uh, that it fits. We are always above uh, the, there is no, no, I take it, I'll show you another, where it's for all four years. There's no necessity to um, of browner. That's a summer with a lot of photovoltaics, the photovoltaics sitting on top every midday in Germany. Again, it runs. You see that clearly in Germany, in winter, is the highest electricity necessity. And if you take this one, it's a little complicated, but important is only this line there, this line there upstairs. These are four years, and uh, this is the capacity, the needed capacity at that hour. And always, it was below that. It's a bit complicated. Scientists sometimes make curves not very, comp not very understandable. As long as you stay under this line, the system doesn't trip off. Okay. That's the information you have to get. And there's only one part or two parts there where we have where we had to um, get somewhere else something. Ninety percent in Germany. Ninety, ninety-three percent in Germany. It's possible. If you look at the costs, we are calculating different costs. It's very interesting because cost calculation for the different uh, archetypes are very different. Assume we would put a lot of money in the next 10 years into decentralized house-based um, storage system. Then we would have very cheap systems in 10, 15 years. We have seen that with iPhones and other things. Assume you put a lot of money in, in power grids, long distance power grids. It will happen there. It's the learning curve of technology, of other things. So the problem is how to compare these scenarios. The only thing what you can do is compare it against a classical fossil fuel scenario. And this was done in scenarios at the end, 10 years ago, very in detail at the Parliamentarian Commission <coughs> where I was a member. And what came out is assuming that the oil price doesn't go above $60, it's not more true, assuming that we have oil enough and coal enough until 2050, um, then this renewable energy system will cost between 100 to 1,000, depending on the cost current learning curves, euro per year per capita more. The 1,000, I don't believe, because the costs um, already at that time were lower than in that calculation. Let's take something 
in between you can take 500, you can take 250, but everything of that is payable for a German society. But please, remember the assumptions were no oil price change, coal and oil sufficient until 2050, etc., etc. So it's, it's a ridiculous um, comparison we are doing. Today, we, we made other calculations and we found out that we have to, if we really go to 100% as fast as possible, you have to pay 120 euro per capita per year over three decades. So that's um, also nothing which is uh, too much. If you look at in Germany, today we pay for our operas and all these, uh, let's say, culture, 110 euro. So it's for Germany, it's something which is payable. It's the only thing you can compare because looking into the future about prices is a little bit um, glass ball. It's not even glass, it's a broken glass ball because <laughs> if you look into the history of technology and you look at the most important and most uh, famous failures, uh, remember IBM remem and, and decentralized computer power, and that's the same here. If you go into a decentralized system and you calculate it with values of a centralized system, you get prices which which will not fit. And it is the same transformation from a huge system with, uh, let's say, 20, 30 big utilities to a system where you have a huge amount of small and medium-sized utilities and some big, and it's completely different, and the calculation is hard to be done. So this is the future. But I will not end, I don't know how long I have to speak, or I had, I'm allowed to speak. Uh, no, as long as hard. Don't tell it to me because I speak really as long as I want. And um, <laughs> only t because we are spoken about Japan, because I don't have an time here. Um, uh, we, we, this, this study about Japan, uh, which was made some years ago, uh, wait, uh, this was almost this Japan. Not this was six scenarios at that time. This was published in 2002 and 2003, and Japan. Good, that's also again one hour, you know these pictures, the demand and electricity supply is wiggling around. And it is possible, Japan, we didn't believe that, but Japan is able to export energy. The fact is high amount of, uh, photo, uh, of wind and high amount of geothermal energy. Uh, the problem they have with the earthquakes is on the other side of the coin, a source they can use to produce a lot of, of, of energy. Okay, but that's Japan. Let's go and ask ourselves what is the needed pol what is the policy we need f to do that in Germany. We have said we need binding emission reduction renewable targets. We need efficient and intelligent use of energy, which means that you have to increase product standards, management potential, etc. We have to adjust legal and economic framework conditions for introducing renewable energies. We have to align special planning with this. It is not, we have to have a renewable energy, sustainable, econ a nature conservation driven sust uh, special planning. You have to be aware of all this and if you do that well, you can do that uh, good. We have done this for the, the offshore system in Germany. It was a long discussion, but today everyone accepts the areas where we will build our offshore plants and there's a huge potential with this there. We will have building um, infrastructure and requirements for the conventional energy generation fleet, research and development, obtaining social support. But one of the most important things in the electricity grid is the feed-in tariff, because that's, you remember the uh, data, uh, I give you the history, that was the opening of the market. But what means, why are we, Germany, so keen uh, supporting feed in tariff. It is not only transforming um, our energy system, it is also that we think that it is a chance, an economic chance for Germany. We are first movers. Uh, if we do that right, 10 years ago we said that, we will be first movers, we will have an industry, and the second movers also have a chance, and the third movers will lose. So that was one of the, it is a technological instrument. We want to put technology on the ground. And if you want to put technology on the ground, then you have to have give him markets. And we thought also that it, the, the, the government thought also that it's important that a rich region like Germany starts 
to lower the prices of renewable energy technologies because we have other regions of the world, developing regions, where if the prices don't fall, they can't solve the energy problems. And it is a big success for that we have lowered the prices for photovoltaic kilowatt hour. From the first year I calculated it for the Stromeinspeisegesetz, it was 5 D-Mark, 2.5 Euro. And at the moment you get 26 cents, Euro cents from the feed-in tariff. This is a factor of 10 of lowering the price of PV with that instrument. And it was only possible that we pay for the learning curve. What are the things that have to be in a feed-in tariff? We have 27 countries in the world which have feed-in tariff, a feed-in tariff comparable with Germany or other Spain. There are certain, it's not only payment. You have to have a priority connection of installations. It's not enough to pay someone. He has also have to have grid access. And it has to have priority purchase and distribution of electricity. It doesn't help you if you produce electricity from renewables, you get a money, but no one takes it. Guaranteed feed-in tariffs means guaranteed feed-in tariff for a long time, but you have a feed-in tariff in Ontario. I don't need to explain that. Independence of public budget. Don't mix feed-in tariff with public budget. You get immediately problems with the next election, so this is something which works only stable if it is not connected to any taxes and other things. Exclusive use principle means renewables have to have the green light on the electrical grid. And what we do, we should write every two years and as an agency and experience an impact report to the German parliament. We have to do that. It's a huge work asking everyone. This is uh, our reason uh, why we always say we have to go for feed-in tariff. And it, only one example, and in the case of biomass, where we have a huge discussion in Germany about food and uh, biomass, we introduce sustainability ordinances on top of the feed-in tariff so that the development of the feed-in tariff paid electricity doesn't harm another sustainable goals we have, for example, uh, in, the, in the phase of, um, of uh, sustainable bioland. So again, my computer is sinking. It's again one of the new transparencies I have, freshly from the Ministry of Environment and the German Parliament, and um, <laughs> I will send a letter complaining that it hurts my... Uh <laughs> Let's go to the economy, which I wanted to... the fresh numbers of the economy. We had a development of, of, um, of uh, employees in Germany from almost zero in the e area of renewable energies. And I remember 25 years ago, I was at the first summer school for renewable energies in a university teaching about um, simulation. And uh, at that time, there were training engineers, and all of these engineers came after that complaining they don't find any job because no one is working in renewables and no one is really interested in renewables. And I said to them, look, wait a little bit, some years, and there will be the market. Today they're all earning more than I'm earning. So it's, uh, I met them at uh, some of them at the European Photovoltaic Conference two weeks ago and they're earning much more money than me. So it's, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's, uh, it's an exploding industry, and uh, at the moment they are fighting in Germany. There are too few. Ah, there is it. Yes. Uh, this is the money which was moved in the last uh, 20 years in euro, and this led to the market. This led to a market. But before I go to the, the pros, I go to the cons. What are the price? for the normal household. What are the changes? Are the German households starving because they have to pay for the feed-in tariff? You see, again, this curve you know, and this is the terawatt hours produced in the year, and these are the millions in euros, which means that we are moving at the moment in Germany something about 13,000 millions euros in this uh, renewable energy um, sector. This is the development of the price in the last seven, from 2000 to 2007, newer data are not existing. And if you look at these uh, 
small orange part there. This, this, uh, this is what normal consumer pays. It is three cent per kilowatt hour at the moment in Germany for the normal household. Um, the normal household pays something of 20 in the year 2007. At the moment, they are paying much more, 25. The energy, uh, the, the energy utilities have increased in the last year dramatically the electricity price, not due to the reasons of energy uh, of the renewables, due to other reasons. They want to get a little bit back. Um, if you compare this also with the price of the, the energy back to the year uh, 1990, uh, the price increased by 30%, but not due to the fact of the feed-in tariff. It was the, the, the result of the liberalization was that we had 1,000 utilities and now we have only four big ones and 100 medium-sized. So, and this concentration led to an increase of prices even if we have a liberalized market. So this was the, the, the experience we had with that market. So it's not a problem. And... Uh, what happens with that in Germany, with jobs, or let's look in the investments of last year in the, con in the constructions, we had 26 billion um, euro in the last year, in the year 2010, in invested in renewable energies in Germany. That's the reason why we're running. Uh, mainly in photovoltaics. That's the reason why we changed the feed-in tariff last year, twice for photovoltaic. The price of photovoltaic is falling faster than we are following with our uh, laws. The reason is that the Chinese are dumping. They are, I have heard prices on the European Photovoltaic Conference incredible. That's not a real, it's not even, it's a magic price. It's, uh, I don't know where they get the money to, to dump the prices. Um, so we will see in the next one or two years in the photovoltaic uh, um, industry some companies who go off because they can't fight against the, 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 uh, the dumping prices of the Chinese. There are already people talking with the Chinese that if they continue to do that, then Europe will start to close some things. And this is what happens with jobs. We have... 370,000 jobs in Germany today in the field of renewables, built up from almost nothing in 1990 to um, this amount. Wind energy, biomass is a lot of jobs, and that's also why there is a lot of conservative people interested in renewables, because conservative people from Bavaria and other things think that it's a chance for the land area to have a new income. And uh, these jobs are spread mainly into biomass, solar energy, and wind energy. This is what happened in the last 15, 20 years. And if you look, look on the long term, if you ask yourself, what are the possible long term costs of our system? And you take now other um, scenario studies. Um, this is something which I find very interesting. It's a study which was we have different study, but this, uh, this study looks into the differential cost of renewable electricity generation in Germany until 2050. Not under the assumption that we have stable oil prices now with a, with a, let's say, very moderate oil and other prices. And what you see is that Germany, uh, it turns around between 2020 and 2030. After 2020 and 2030, the electricity generation in Germany gets cheaper and cheaper due to the fact that we have transformed more and more into renewables. There are also studies who promise that already for 2015. I haven't taken that because I don't believe them. There are studies who promise that for 2030. I haven't taken that because I don't believe them either. So, but this is um, that what more or less will come, plus or minus some years. And this is the, the long-term story where we convince the people that on the long term it is an investment. On the other side, this is only the cost for electricity. But if you look at the society, if you look at the societal economic situation today, we are already gaining from our renewables due to the fact that we have the jobs, due to the fact that we have a new export. We are an export nation. For us, 50% of these 360,000 people are working for export. That's good. And even the Chinese have to buy glues with us or robots or software or other things. So we stop all this bulk production. We are going, what Germany always does, in the more intelligent products. 
So we started it and now we are moving into that where others can't copy so easily. Um, and that's what we are doing and we are expecting that the money is not flowing to Arabia, it's flowing to our agricultural system, to people having even old, I have friends who are 65, they all they retire now. They take their last money, part of that, and invest in photovoltaic and wind and say, look, I have a term back, 20 years, secure, with 8 to 11 percent. Why should I go to a bank? I don't know if this bank survives 10 years, but I know that my feed in tariff runs 20 years, so why shouldn't I do it? And this money is going and it's staying in the country and it's one of the ways we are doing. So, I don't want a, this, a lot of numbers, a lot of things, but to get it together to one sentence is first, if you want to do it in Ontario, be aware that it is not only a feed-in tariff. It is educating people, it is having a discussion, bringing all people into the, into the game you think that you need to have into the, in this game. And again, I want to come back to this one picture I showed you, this, all these regions. Oops, uh, there. We have these regions already. So you have to mobilize the area the land areas outside. I've seen a study about huge potential the agricultural system in Ontario can have going into renewable energies. So you have to mobilize and train all the people. And then you have to take away administrative hindrances. You have to take away hindrances in the head that it doesn't work. You have to take away uh, or to at least um, force people that don't believe that, that they don't disturb and uh, whatever. And then you have to convince people to in invest. And then you have to have a feed-in tariff that the people get the money back from their investment. And then it will run. And at the beginning it runs smoothly and then it grows exponential. So be patient at the beginning because the, these five or six years you, you have at the beginning, you need. And then it explodes as we have it today in Spain, in Italy, in Czechia, in Germany all feed-in tariff countries. So I can only advise you to do this um, connected strategy, information, education, administrative um, activities, and a nice feed-in tariff, and speak with the banks that they also put money on into the system so that you can lend money. We, I never um, I went to a lot of banks. Today, banks in Germany accept the photovoltaic installation as a secure so you don't have to put money in addition. It is enough that you have a photovoltaic installation which is sealed and good, and then you get the money from the bank. So the system runs even faster now. So 1% was that the guy 15 years ago as we started with the feed-in tariff said, it's never possible. We have 20%, we will have 35% in 2020, we will deal with 60% in the year 2030, at least, and we plan that we have 100% from renewable energies in the year 2050. And it is possible um, from a technological, from an ecological and an economical point of view. And uh, I have to thank you for the long time you have followed my words. Thank you. Well, now, now what we try to do is, um, in the schedule, it says that uh, we're going to open up the floor. Um, we started a little late, so uh, we ask you to please keep uh, your um, questions very succinct and to the point. But now is the time uh, for the next half an hour at least, if, if it's okay with you, uh, to ask the nitty gritty detailed questions that may, you may have in your uh, mind. Um, and just to ensure that we get to your answer, say your name. Uh, so if we cannot answer your question right now, uh, we can get back to you with the answer. Uh, but uh, the floor is open. I'm not sure if there's a microphone. Uh, there is a microphone. So just lift your hand and somebody will come with a microphone uh, to you. Uh, so thank you, Harry. I killed them. <laughs> Someone who Somebody's got to be the first one to dive in the pool. Um, 
my name is Michael Rayner, Dr. Lehman, an inspiring presentation to be sure. Um, those projections, uh, do they include um, transport? And uh, Once or twice you had a, an aside where you sort of took transport off the table. I'm wondering if that includes sort of all the trucks becoming electric trucks or if you're still burning fossil fuels for automobiles uh, and transport generally, aviation, that sort of thing. Uh, how does that fit into your, into your modeling? Well, we also are, I have focused on electrical system and uh, this, the other one we also have to look at is buildings. And if you look at buildings, um, let's take first that, uh, has a certain reason. Uh, if you take out the buildings, then you, um, we know from building codes we have today in Germany that we can in, in, in lower the necessities for uh, fossil fuels in the buildings by at least a factor two, factor three, until the year 2015, but we have to increase our retrofitting and sanitation rate by a factor of two. That's where today we, uh, we have a plan in Germany to do that. There's a lot of money moved into ret re retrofitting of buildings. This means that on the other side we need less natural gas because heating is a lot with natural gas. This means that you can use this natural gas in the transport sector one of the sources you have for the transport sector. The other one is you, you never will run an electrical truck, forget it about it. It's, uh, what it uh, so probably if you look at the, the uh, oh, let's start around. There might be a solution with nearby small distance electric cars, with bicycles, electro bicycles we have today on the market, with in, in cities. Then mid-range you go to whatever hybrid, hydrogen hybrid or methane hybrid or even a normal motor, classical motor running with methane. You can buy one today in Germany. You can have a BMW with methane gas in it. And then long range and um, huge bulks of, uh, of load, you will go to hydrogen or methane, something like in that region. <clears throat> and last but not least, airplanes, yes, uh, again, methane, British Airways is already trying to find a so-called f uh, renewable fuel. They, they, they are trying to, to convert waste into a fuel they can use for the airplanes. We have other studies done by um, other companies, especially Airbus, which are studying hydrogen. We know how an Airbus should look like if it uses hydrogen. To be honest, in this sector, the realization, the realization means what you can buy as far um, back to that what was promised 10 years ago. The car industry in Europe has uh, a power which is tremendous. And that means that if you go today at the running Frankfurt International Automotive um, Exhibition, they are showing you some electrical cars nicely, but none of these cars will never touch the market. They, they can't do that. They have promised to do that. They have promised to give one million cars on the German market until 2020 to the last government if the government don't increase the efficiency uh, goals. The government didn't increase the efficiency goals, but no one knows where these one million cars come from. It's, we have 2011, and if there will be one million cars in year, year 2020 on the market, then they have to start something now. If not, they're not in the market. So it, it, with that price, okay, Tesla, but you know the price of Tesla. It's a nice car, I've driven it. It's a, a nice gadget. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but that's the problem. You, you touch the real problem, that's transport. And in the transport sector, we think that we can increase the efficiency of transport kilometers, persons or tonnage uh, or load, but um, it is where we have to do a lot of research to bring it on the ground. But from that, what we know from the, 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 the Teslas and the others and the running cars. We have a city running with hydrogen, the buses. We have a city in Germany running the buses with, and the lorries with methane. So it is there, but it's not on, in the mass production. It's not only a demonstration. It's really um, running since years, but no one produces that. So 
And, and there was a very honest uh, commentary <coughs> of one of the CEOs of a big German company. He said, as long as we survive with the old technologies, we will continue to make money with that. So, okay. <coughs> David, sir. Um, what, what has the response been from the, the incumbents, the electrical utilities? Because I can see that you can face solar and wind turbines in over time, but you can't really switch off a nuclear plant, you know, you know 100, 100 megawatts at a time. It, and so, so what has been the response from the, the electrical utility that the, all these new renewables will be replacing? You know, have they been, you know, the 1% comment that you mentioned, you know, is, is it sort of a denial or is it a, yeah. Has that changed? Yes, it has changed. But it's uh, There are some of the people like RWE, which is uh, one of the four big, who bet on the continuation of uh, nuclear. Grossman, uh, who is the CEO of, um, of uh, RWE, put his future into the, the idea of prolonging the lifetime of nuclear energy, and he is not more CEO. So that's the answer how the companies are reacting. They are trying to find new. Vattenfall is uh, moving very well. E.ON is in the midst of the game. They are realizing that um, um, the framework condition have changed. So what they do is they are, they are making a lot of daughters which enter the, the, uh, the renewable energy market. And the more the people in the classical utilities learn how the game is, the better they are uh, speaking about renewables. It's also a matter of education of people who were working in that field for decades. So it's, uh, they are changing. But some people have to go, like Grossman, for example. That's, he's, uh, he's one that tall, that size. Very nice guy. You can drink a lot of beer with him. You have a fun evening, uh, but uh, he's very uh, stubborn. Is the, I think this is the right word in English. Um, so that's uh, the, the, the history. You have in Germany more and more small and medium-sized um, Stadtwerke, utilities of cities and regions, that very silently are entering the future market because they say that's fitting to us. Uh, cogeneration, using wind there, photovoltaics there, a little bit uh, hydro storage there, etc. So it's something where we sitting in the region know how to do that. And uh, the classical utility has a problem not to know to, until today what happens in, in different regions. And, but it's changing. It's changing slowly. The, 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 the hardest are monopolist, centralized utilities in Europe, where they still don't speak about um, renewable energy future. But in Germany, in Spain, Iberdrola or others, they are moving because they think that's their future. <coughs> I just want to ask you regarding the geothermal. Uh, you guys saying you're just starting in Germany to use the geothermal technology. Uh, do you think there's going to be any side effect if we go like, you know, full power like with the geothermal because like a BC and some parts of Ontario, they already using the geothermal. What do you think would be any side effect if we drill so many holes? Because pretty much we can heat at the houses and we can use that energy for like creating the power. But uh, to drilling several houses like, you know, next door to each other, do you think we can cooling out the globe or will be any side effect? <coughs> There is no technology without side. Oh, okay, that's it. Yeah, thank you. There is no technology without side effect. Clearly, let's talk about geothermal. You have different uh, levels of geothermal. If you take the, the first 10, 20 meters geothermal, there are a lot of experience in Europe that in the regions where you can use geothermal, the side effect, if you have done it properly, is almost zero. Um, you can also use, not only geothermal, you can also use um, water from rivers, like in Hamburg, for example. Then you have to be a little bit uh, aware that you don't uh, cool down your river or heat up the river in, in certain times of the year. 
it's the amount of water you're using, but it's something which is known from uh, several studies about cooling um, classical utilities. If you go deeper, you drill, then the question gets complicated. It depends what is the, uh, the, the, the structure below you. There are, we had the situation in South Germany where there was a drilling and suddenly um, the, the earth came up. What happened? There was gypsum in below that and due to the drilling water entered the gypsum layer and chemical reactions made a growing of the gypsum and uh, destroyed some houses. Okay. To be honest, they would never had had drilled there if it, this is not a place where you would have used it. So it, it, the places, we, we have such a map for Germany uh, where you can do it, the, the, the side effects are low, not zero, because if you make a lot of low uh, drills down, you will have some um, probably small earthquakes below the, not like, <laughs> you mean ripples and all these things, because, uh, but that's the same you have with coal. So if you, if you suck out coal from deep areas, you have the same effect. We have them in Nordrhein-Westphalia. We have a lot of uh, these small earthquakes due to the old coal stations, and you can deal with that. Our argument is use geothermal as much as possible, but without that side effect. So don't go through gypsum or th other uh, regions uh, where it's not good. It's also a problem if you go to certain uh, areas where you have um, water storage below. So you have to be aware that you don't uh, destroy these uh, water um, aquifer we have there. Taking all this in account, Germany has still a negligible amount of geothermal potential, especially in the area <coughs> around Hamburg uh, and in the area around München. And at the moment they are drilling there and we will see what uh, the findings are, because uh, you know the joke about uh, the Pope in the geophysics. The Pope was never in heaven, and the geophysics was never downstairs, so you don't know what is there, and so you have to drill first. <laughs> hey, my name is Peter Burke. Um, I guess a question about one of your slides. So it looks like between now and 2020, uh, new fossil fuel power plants are coming online. Some are already planned, and natural gas is planned, you were saying. And then taking nuclear offline, wouldn't it mean that the CO2 emissions would actually go up in the electricity sector? Ah, I waited for that question. Yeah, that, I knew that. <laughs> Thank you. No, we are in, in Europe. In Europe, we have an emission trading system. Each utility which wants to produce electricity from coal and gas has to buy an emission allowance. The emission allowance are kept and they go down until 2050. So we know today what the emissions are which are allowed in the next years. Now that you take out nuclear, what happens? You need, assuming that renewables don't grow, no? we assume renewables don't grow. So you need more um, emission, you need more electricity in kilowatt hours from the existing fossil system. That means having stable amount of emission allowances, you, you, you move the market to the more efficient uh, system because they have better prices. So a gas system suddenly is better on the market than a coal system or the more efficient coal system than the, the old coal system. At the end, you don't have any CO2 emission more because the emission allowance is kept but you move, you force your market to more efficient technologies. Now putting in account that you have also cogeneration coming, you have renewables coming, etc., then the system gets uh, um, more complicated. But in principle, no addition, because it's capped, no additional uh, CO2 emissions. <coughs> Uh, Karen Clark with their TD Bank. My, my question actually follows on that. Uh, a lot of the analyses used uh, price of oil as a benchmark, but um, I don't think in our context it's really accurate to use price of oil because we don't 
generate electricity from oil, um, our ch and we're not going to soon be generating it from coal. So I think the challenge for us, uh, especially in Ontario, is gas is really cheap. And um, when we're doing, when you would do these analyses, if you used um, an alternative benchmark, how would, and we also have um, hydroelectric. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have a sense of if you had done these analyses with a different benchmark than oil, um, how that would have affected the economics. The reason that we use oil is that in Europe, the price of gas is connected to the oil price. So it's linked. Um, and at the moment, there are discussions to break up this link. Uh, and uh, so in, in Europe, gas price is not cheap because it moved up with oil price. And uh, that's the reason why we use it in Europe. But uh, Clearly, if you, if, you con if you take cheap natural gas against it, then um, the, comp the comparison is worse for the renewables because you have a cheap electricity coming from natural gas. Hydro is renewable, so it's, uh, we know, the cheapest renewable running. So it's, uh, at that case, it's pro-renewable. But um, if you look at that, uh, you have to be aware that wind especially wind, biomass, and others, are very low down at the moment with the prices. The wind energy, if you look at the prices you, you, you have in, 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 in Europe at the moment, especially with big um, windmills, uh, they start to be competitive on the production level. And that means that in a few years, um, we will have a completely different situation. One situation which is at the moment preparing that natural gas and wind starts to be two twins. That natural gas, due to the fact that it can go up and down, and wind are put together as a virtual utility, and they react on demand on the market, on the, on the, on the supply need. Uh, on the su I need it. So that's what we observe at the moment in the European market. And then you are talking not more of one technology, you are talking of system costs. The means, what are the system costs to, f to follow certain things? And then you start also, that is something for the future, to think about feed in tariffs for storage system or feed in tariff for people who are allowed to uh, or are able to follow, your producers who are able to follow the, 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 the demand. One last comment. We already expect, for exa example, in Germany, photovoltaic grid parity for households between 2017 and 2020. Grid parity means that photovoltaic produced on your roof top is equal in the price that for the price you pay for your kilowatt hours. This is not a reason to stop the feed-in tariff. If, you, if we go into our models, if you stop making a feed-in tariff, what happens? Two things are off. The first one is the, the, your secure supply to the grid. That means that the feed-in tariff will continue with low prices to have a security of supply for the people who invest in that. As a bank, you need something. You have a security of the money coming back. Means even if the technologies go below that grid parity, we need to have a feed-in tariff so that we have the 20 years of, of income. So yet you can calculate your income, <laughs> what you need. And that's, a lot of people think at the moment we have a grid parity, let's stop with feed-in tariff. We have achieved our goal. It's not true, because you have to give the investors a security to, to so sell the, 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 the renewables to the, to the grid. And that's... Uh, Now what are you going to do? <laughs> uh, Chris Terrell, Toronto Hydro. Um, we've certainly loved your presentation, and it's great to see, because I think you know, Ontario's really sort of emulated the, the whole policy and, uh, through our Green Energy Act. We run into two constraints, I think, that for market penetration, and those are my, my questions. One is, how did you overcome nimbyism, not in my backyard? Mm -hmm. And the other one is really, who pays for the interconnect when there's constraints on the grid? Those are the two that really cause us market you know, barrier uh, restrictions. The grid operator pays in, in Europe and Germany. So they have to build up and they have to put it onto the prices for the... For, we have divided grid and uh, power production. And uh, 
since some months is really divided. Amprion was the last company which was sold by RWE. RW, uh, 20 years ago, as we made this liberalization, um, the utilities were forced to divide production and uh, grid. But what they did, they, they founded two daughters and one holding. And it was from the left in the right uh, bucket. Yes, thank you. And now um, the European Union forced them really to, uh, to liberalize, to, to sell the parts. And now the, grids, the grid operators are not more the same, owned by the same than the uh, utilities. And now suddenly they have another interest than before, and they are trying now to retrofit, to build what we named the, 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 the grid of the future. And we are looking into detail, not we, there is a German energy agency, we also, uh, we always not have the same opinion of them, but we looked at how much kilometers of new high voltage line, all these things you need. And if you look at that, you see we have in Germany 35,000 kilometers of high voltage lines, and we would need in such an um, 2020, 2030 uh, scope, something about 5,000 kilometers additional um, kilometers in the worst case. We also calculated uh, away with thousands, but okay, it's thousand to five thousand. But that's that what normally also happens. It's, uh, you have to adapt to different sites of production. We, for example, we see in Germany the, the plants which run with coal or natural gas are moving to other places. In the 40s and 50s and 60s, they were built in North Rhine-Westphalia, where the coal was and where the steel was. Now they move to the north, so in any case, we would have to reinforced to adapt the high voltage system. On the distribution system on 250 voltage, uh, there's no problem. For the distributed photovoltaic, we have learned that it is not a problem to put it on the roofs because you have already a grid. And as long as you assume certain amount of demand at a certain region, it's the same what you can deliver as supply, more or less. So let's don't go into details. It's, it's, depends how you have built your, your, your interconnections. But in principle, the existing decentralized grid you use for supplying your, your household can also be used for taking the energy back um, for decentralized production. That's the one thing. You had us NIMBY. Yeah, NIMBY. <laughs> a nice story about NIMBY. <clears throat> there was in Germany uh, one of these 50 regions, you know, and that's important because uh, that's one of the, the things why we think that NIMBY in Germany is existing, but we are solving the problem more and more. Uh, wait, 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 oops, there. <clears throat> I have to go a little bit into detail, and then I, you understand what I mean with NIMBY. These are different regions, and different regions, all these dark blue ones, are regions where the communities, the city majors, the, 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 the parliaments of the city, decided to make a plan to go to 100% until 2050. This is the dark blue. The light blue are regions, so-called starter regions. They are starting, or they're running at the moment, a discussion, an open discussion in their communities, should we or should we not go for 100. Then we have this uh, red. They have committed themselves to go 2050 by lowering 50% of greenhouse gases. So I'm going from the most uh, advanced to the next step. So in all these, and the last one is these uh, yellow ones. Um, they only committed themselves to make a plan. And uh, goals are not yet written. But if you look at that, you have 50% of all communities and regions in Germany have at the moment an open discussion, where do we go? That means that they are talking about special planning. Where, where do we put that? Where do we put a road? Where do we put wind energy? That? That's the first thing to prevent NIMBY. And the second thing is give the people the chance to earn money with the renewables. Feed-in tariff allows you to make um, solutions. <coughs> I was speaking with a bank last week in, in Hamburg. It's a bank 
who is offering now a model for Germany means uh, that allows 20% of the in investment coming from very small people, paying 100 euro, 200 euro, 300 euro, and 80% comes from big investors. So, and they open it in a city, and they say, look, everyone can enter, everyone can put 100, 200, 500. If you are below, ab above 1,000 euro, you get, as below 1,000 euro, you get a certain percentage. Above 1,000 euro, you get a certain percentage. Above 10,000 euro, you get more. And more than 50,000, you get even more percentage. But everyone can put money into it. And then you get more money than on your uh, book in the bank account today. And this leads to the situation that the people likes that suddenly, because if the windmill turns and you know that the money is going also into your bucket, yeah, you are happy. But if it turns and you think, ah, oh, that's a bloody rich guy from Munich who is earning some money, uh, then you get angry. And, to con and it is even that hard at the moment. There was a, a court decision now <laughs> in, in January. They had to tore down a windmill, a very expensive, three and a half megawatt windmill in a NIMBY. But the guys who fought against this windmill, which was 50 meters on the wrong place, they owned the three other windmills, which were 50 meters a little bit far away. So it's NIMBY, it's a question of money, of information, and all these things. And you always will have a certain percentage of people who are against everything. So that's... Uh, Yeah, there's time. Um, Jeremy Crane, uh, I w you touched quickly on energy storage uh, with your goals of a very high penetration system. Obviously, Germany will again be the leader in uh, developing storage, uh, both uh, I guess time shifting and, um, and probably stability um, uh, technologies. How do you see that affecting, what, how do you see us uh, absorbing that cost either? Is there going to be a f absorbing the cost of that? Is there going to be a feed-in tariff uh, schedule that would be appropriate, or is there going to be a, some other mechanism? Um, and what uh, you mentioned two technologies, the hydro being probably something that's maybe 80 percent 80 efficiency and chemical 50, 60 percent efficiencies. So there's a, a significant loss, obviously, we'd see there. If, if you have a, a huge amount of renewable energy electricity, um, it's not that important more how your efficiency of your storage system is. Because if you go to, um, uh, we, we have studied also 50, 60% in other examples, um, using regional potential. And what, what one of the characteristics of this future system is that there are a lot of um, hours in the year where you have an overproduction um, due to the fact that you designed a system that even in the worst case will deliver 100% electricity you need. That means on the other side, you have another situation, overcapacity. And in the moment you have overcapacity, um, efficiency is important, but not that as we saw today, where if you take fossils and you put it, store it, then efficiency is very important because you lose, you have 30% and then again only 40%. But efficiency is in this case not that important, more important is for us in that we look on resource efficiency. That means which resources you use for store that. Electromobility, if we talk about the materials you need, do we have enough lithium, do we have enough coltan for all these ideas the people have? So that's probably uh, the most uh, problematic factor in electromobility. And if you not talk about one million cars and you talk about 80 million cars in Germany, um, where do we get the lithium and the coltan for the first build up of the system before the things come back? If you have a recycling system, you can use it back, but you first have to build it up and how to do that. So, and you can take a lot of examples in this transformation system where the major problem is the resource efficiency. And the second major problem is the area problem. That's the reason why, for example, we as an agency say that biomass will not have that future a lot of people think because in the year 2050 or even 2030 we have to feed 8 billion people and feeding 8 billion people with changing um, 
patterns of food means that we have a land area problem. That means that biomass, so some people think today in Brazil or in other areas of the world, will not have that future they assume. So we think that biomass will have a role, but after taking all these C atoms through the system, cascading and at the end burning, so first take it as a material or a food and at the end use it as, as a burning uh, supply. So that's the second thing. And uh, so efficiency is not that important. Second comment, um, how to promote a uh, storage system. At the moment, we don't have the idea that there is the storage system which would solve the problem, the silver bullet. So at the moment, we argue to the German government and to the parliament of the society, please put money in every basket. We don't know what is the, the technology of the future, so please don't do the hypes of the last year where, where electromobility, they, they sunk millions of euros uh, giving that to the German automotive industry, which had the money, so they didn't need it really, but it was, politicians like that and so they supported German automotive uh, cars and what came out for that millions is that what we already had 10 years ago so it's uh, the development was very small <coughs> we asked that they should put money into chemical storage into short time storage from flywheel to pressurized uh, vapor to whatever so that we have a bunch of possibilities for storage and then we should um, expect that in a system which goes more to an, to an internet-like electrical system. We have an electrical system which will be like the internet today. And then you will have distributed storage. I don't know what the iCloud of the electrical system of 2030 is, but there will be people that are thinking about that to do that. Swarm utilities, something which is very funny. In Germany, there is a company um, which is Sell or buying the right in buildings to put a small motor in the, in, the, in the cellar. It's a VW motor, Lichtblick is the company. They want to have 60,000 motors in the next two years. And they want to sell electricity. And they have a small heating storage system there. So what they do is they sell electricity, but they get a surplus selling heating to the houses. And, um, it's a little bit on the top because normally you make cogeneration for the heating and the electricity is your, your they change it and they put all these 30,000 motors together with an internet connection. So for the utility of a region, it's like it's, they can go up, they can go down and all these things. It's, I don't know where this idea will go, but this is like distributed computing heute, uh, today. So we will have distributing produce, production in the future. They are doing that at the moment, developing software, all that learning and all these things. We know that there is a producer of a steam machine. <laughs> steam machine, a very small steam machine connected with a linear motor. This linear motor has an electric um, of one kilowatt. One kilowatt means that it's enough for a German household. But you use all your, elect you use all your sources for making steam. It's the other way around. You have biomass, you have, uh, and the steam utility can produce electricity for you and the grid. This is the nitty, really small thing. If the price they are expecting that it is in the same amount as a normal heating system in Germany, then suddenly from the heating system, um, electricity is coming. We don't know what happens. So storage, there are a lot of stories which will come and will surprise us. But we are putting money into it and in each basket, as if possible. Government not, but uh, <laughs> we should spread it. And, uh, and then the feed in tariff, clearly. Put, give them a feed in tariff to be in the market, yes. Eric, um, two questions. Um, we're actually coming to an end. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, oops, thank you. <coughs> I, we're coming to an end. Uh, yeah. I'm supposed to actually do the concluding remarks, uh, but I wanted to ask if people are okay, I want to pose two clarification questions. I, is that okay with everybody? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Okay. Uh, the first one. Offer if someone has a question by email, it's, 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 I can put my email.
I'll, I'll ask you my question quickly, uh, yeah. if, if I may. Um, yeah. The first one has to do with, it's a hypothetical question. Uh, from what you have said, it's crystal clear um, that the feeding tariffs in um, Germany will not be changed. But let's assume tomorrow you had an election in Germany and a new chancellor had it in uh, his or her brain uh, to cancel the feeding tariff program. Um, what would be the uh, business repercussions and the social repercussions of canceling Germany's feeding tariff uh, program? That's my first question. Um, yeah, that would be a major hit. But um, the, the, that's, this is a scenario which is uh, unthinkable. Today, every party in Germany has feed in tariff in their program as part of the future. Uh, the question is, uh, the one likes more the biomass, uh, the other likes more photovoltaics, and the others like more wind, offshore wind. So, but the, 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 the strategy feed in tariff is in each party, so there is no discussion in Germany about getting rid of the feed-in tariff. We have a discussion on the European level because the Commission likes quota models, whatever reasons, whatever. Always they come with a quota model, but we have a majority of European countries who have the feed-in tariff. So on the European level, there's always the discussion between the European Commission and the countries uh, feed-in tariff, no, yes, is it a market uh, instrument or no, is it subsidies or no, and always this turns around and turns around. But on the European level, we have at the moment the, the decision that until 2020, each country can choose its own mixture and measures and instruments. Okay, as long as that happens, Germany, Spain, Czechia, Denmark was, now it hopefully comes back, um, will be countries which have feed in tariff. And, uh, and obviously, I, I made, if you look at the prices, the, the, the prices paid by feed in tariff today in Germany, in Austria, in Czechia, in Spain, and in um, um, other countries, the, the prices which are paid are the lowest for a kilowatt hour in the world. And it is in the regions where the biggest uh, increment where the biggest installation are. Other models, I was in California and I was talking with them, they pay twice as we for photovoltaic. It's crazy. I take them, my money and go to California. Because if, if you get an allowance, you get double. They have that huge amount of, of sun and they pay double. And that's not the only one example around. The, England, UK, they paid such a money for, for wind energy they get so few wind energy and they are paying so much for that few wind energy because that's that quota model. So it's feed-in tariff, I think, is accepted in Germany, in the majority of countries in, Ger in Europe, and um, yeah. In English, we call that a trick question because as many of the people in the audience will know, at the moment in Ontario, that is precisely the question that people are posing, whether this makes sense or not. And it wasn't intended as a trick question. I thought it was a provocative question to be able to develop a roadmap for renewable energy in Ontario. The last question I have, which is not a trick question, but I think it merits a great deal of clarification because this was something that people in the audience I don't think would have picked up very easily. Um, here in Ontario, we're making a transition to uh, combined heat and power and district energy that only began uh, not in earnest, uh, but it's moving in that direction. There's a few municipalities that are beginning to experiment with combined heat and power and district energy. And you talked about a transition to use what you call the solarization uh, of uh, gas. And uh, this is a conversation that it's not occurring in Canada yet. And I think it would merit that you explain a little bit to people what it actually means to use renewable energy to uh, use methane uh, as a storage device? Um, this is a new discussion we had. In, we were always looking into the laboratories and uh, what are the guys inventing, guys and girls, um, and uh, in this case only. This is the, the idea behind that. Um, 
you have is there's no okay let's check, check, check. one day is no no it's uh, okay there is you have wind solar and other renewables they produce electricity with this electricity, you make hydro with classical hydrolysis, you make um, hydrogen. You can now take from the atmosphere biomass, waste industry, cement and steel industry, and fossil fuels, which we don't like, but you take carbon dioxide, put it there, and you can make uh, methanation. That runs today. We have one um, demonstration site where they produce the me methane with that methodology for the buses of a city. So to learn how to deal with it. And this methane is put into the gas system. And then you can again use it with CHP and turbines and produce electricity. So it's a, uh, you have a system which goes in and the, the, why I like that is because I like it especially because you don't have to build up a new infrastructure. If you go to a full hydrogen world, then someone has to pay for the infrastructure because you need an additional infrastructure. That was always the problem with the hydrogen solution. And if you go to a mixture of solar hydrogen and solar methane, then you don't need an additional infrastructure. You first start putting into the natural gas system hydrogen, because the natural gas itself contains hydrogen. Until a certain amount, you can increase it. And then, then you put more and more solar methane into it, so that the system gets more and more solarized or renewableized or like, like how do you like it. And this is something you can do step by step. First with 1% and then somewhere 15, 20, 30. And that's, is, uh, and you can also adapt to the coming increase of natural gas prices because we expect that natural gas will increase in the price. If everyone who looks into the price of the future expects it. And so you have a, a smooth transition. That's one of the reasons why we think that it's one of the solutions we have today. This doesn't mean that someone can invent something new. There are other uh, things, uh, storage of hydrogen in metals and storage of hydrogen in, in tanks and liquid hydrogen, all these things. We think that it is too expensive and it's too much infrastructure you need. And with this infrastructure you need additional resources and these resources is the, is the problem. So that's why we at the moment favorize this system and uh, we were something which was very funny. We published in June 2010 this scenario with the gas. We are publishing every half year scenario at the moment uh, because we're following the discussion and all these things. <laughs> Two months later, the natural gas industry made an advertisement in the biggest German papers, one page, natural gas, the, the partner of renewable energies in the future. I've fall by that because I never suspect that they take that up now. At the moment, they are only making advertisement with that, but it's uh, hope that they will enter it. So they got the idea. Um, so I, I want to conclude uh, just by uh, thanking uh, Harry Lemon. Uh, one of the things I did not mention to you because I wanted to say this at the end, uh, Dr. Harry Lemon was also recently uh, selected to be uh, the chairman of the World Council of Renewable Energy. Many of you knew uh, Herman Scheer. I did not want to talk at the beginning about Herman because A, it makes me sad and B, uh, it's this day was about you, not about him. Uh, but Harry is now uh, the first uh, successor of Herman Scheer in the uh, World Council of Renewable Energy. And I have to really thank you because he's come a very long way. He only came to Canada to talk to you today. Uh, and that's a great deal of an effort. Um, and so why don't we give him a round of applause as a way.